for the folks in class. In case you don't know, Hugo has made his first appearance <laughs> all, all the way from Boston. That's great. <laughs> Well, um, I, I love I love being in front of people. So I wish I was there in person. Um, so maybe next time we uh, visit San Francisco, I'll go visit uh, the Absolutely. campus. Um, awesome. It sounds like we're recording now. Thank you so much, Dr. Catabayo. Um, And again, starting off, again, very privileged to be um, here tonight with this amazing panel. Um, and we, I just wanted to again start off with um, with Taylor, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your journey, and then we'll go around the table and then, and then get to some Q&A. Hi everyone, um, my name is Taylor. And first I wanna just say thank you to Dr. Johnson for even considering me for this panel. I'm so grateful to be here. And to Ugo, I am personally offended <laughs> that I did not know that you were in San Francisco. Um, and I was looking at the Zoom and I'm like, well, that can't be Ugo because Ugo's in Boston. <laughs> I text you my, my concern. Anyway, <laughs> nice to see everyone. Um, just getting into it. Again, my name is Taylor. I am the founder of Girls Gain Confidence. My nonprofit focuses on working with girls ages 12 to 17 years old. We focus on self-esteem and self-advocacy skills and as well as academic excellence. Um, I started this work in 2019 when I was a sophomore getting my bachelor's degree at St. Mary's. Um, I started this work in Oakland, California, and I've just been, I've been doing it ever since. And through the nonprofit administration program, I ended up achieving my 501c3 um, with the support of all my classmates. They know the journey. <laughs> um, and so now I have my 501c3 status and I am at, at this very moment raising money to host a historically black college tour, which I've come a long way with that. We're almost at our goal. Um, and yeah, more, moral of the story, just working with, you know, black girls in Oakland, trying to assist them with just figuring out why they're here in life and, and what they're called to be. Sorry, that was very, um, general and all over the place. Um, oh, and this educational background as well. I, I got my bachelor's degree um, from St. Mary's College of California in Justice, Community, and Leadership. And then I just finished at USF um, last semester, actually, um, nonprofit administration. Awesome. awesome. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Taylor. And we'll, we'll talk some more. I'm, I'm so curious. And and um, I, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, OK, so then I'll, we'll move on to Abby. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Abby Pearl. Um, I am currently living in New Jersey. Um, I actually cannot believe Ugo is in San Francisco after I left San Francisco <laughs> and I'm now back on the East Coast, but that's okay. Um, I did the Masters of Nonprofit Administration program, uh, same track as Taylor did, a uh, full-time program, graduated in summer of 2022. Um, and uh, how I got here really is um, I've always been um, interested in the nonprofit sector since high school. Um, after leaving high school, um, I decided to start my own nonprofit organization, Kind Mind Collective. Um, we ran that from the ages, um, or my age of 16 to uh, 21, I'm 23 now. Um, and so the five years I was doing that, um, I really put a focus on um, outreach programming for middle and high school students on anti-bullying and LGBTQ acceptance training. Um, we were able to go through five states, um, one of them being Texas, where um, I had an internship uh, with a um, separate outreach um, nonprofit. Um, and I was able to teach my programming there, which was very special, um, also considering very strict um, anti-LGBTQ laws in Texas. Um, and uh, after stopping working on my organization, um, I really wanted to focus uh, on the nonprofit sector as a whole and what I've learned and what I can 
um, continue to learn um, within the sector um, and the M&A program definitely helped me with that. And now uh, being back in New Jersey, um, I am really um, honing down on my worth and my value in the nonprofit sector and really taking some time to, um, you know, spend time with family since being in San Francisco um, for the past year, uh, but also um, really finding a position at a nonprofit that um, will respect and value my worth um, that I could provide to a nonprofit and also really find a nonprofit whose values I really aligned with. Um, did my uh, capstone on the cannabis industry in uh, New Jersey um, and how nonprofits are connected to that. So uh, been working on that, been working on other things that I'm very passionate about. Um, but yeah, very excited to chat. Abby, where's, where's your kitty cat? Your, your kitty oh my God, he's here with me. Hold on. at this time. Here he is. He joined me like every class um, throughout the program. He yeah. would always be in frame. It, it would not be a, a, a panel without uh, your kitty cat joining us. So. Yes. What's his What's his name? Panda. Panda. <laughs> we'll do a bio for Panda if we ever do this again. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let, let's move on. Bree, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, same, and a little bit about um, just what you do and your passion? Yeah, definitely. Um, I am very familiar with most of the folks in the room. I am finishing up my last semester. Hey, guys, I had my FOMO moment with the Ugo sighting last night, so <laughs> I'm not even going to talk about it right now. Um, <laughs> I'll see you at graduation. Um, <laughs> so basically, I got my start in nonprofit when I was in my undergraduate education. Um, I founded a local philanthropic sorority, and we volunteered at places like Habitat for Humanity, Costa Pacifica Centers for Children and Families, and um, Humane Centers of Ventura County, and I started that process for them to become an incorporated organization um, with the sorority, and then I worked in a nonprofit hospital as a health scholar while I was in school, which led me to start at Planned Parenthood. Um, I really wanted to get back into like that administrative side of things and help on the back end, so um, I was exposed to a lot of stuff. I was exposed to how nonprofits run and um, all the way from the administrative side to the programs and development side and started working at their flagship office where I got to learn a lot working closely with their VPs of development and community government relations and um, hosting events for them and working really closely with CEO and president of that organization. So it was an amazing experience on my part. Um, got to do a lot of things at their board meetings, fundraising events, and I spoke to you know, government officials in San Francisco, like the Senator Scott Weiner, um, made my way to my current organization, APCHO, where I'm actually manager of executive and board affairs. And that organization is a fully remote and national organization. So we have people all around the country to ensure that we're reaching out to all of the areas that underserved um, AA and HPI communities are at. And we just advocate for them, um, their health access and health needs. And I've had the opportunity to attend a lot of those like national conferences, presidential committee meetings and government advisory boards addressing those needs of AA and HPI communities. And it's really fulfilling to work, you know, for organizations like that, that are doing good for the community. And it, it ties in with my passion for working and advocating for students that hail from those underserved and marginalized communities. So the m and program was kind of my, my last step in trying to start my nonprofit where I can reach that goal of um, benefiting underserved and underrepresented college students and their families and providing easier access for them and resources so they can succeed um, while they're in school, but also retaining that after school. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I What I was hoping we would do is I was hoping we would have more of a conversation, guys. And um, I think that we have questions and I have questions and I, I can ask a question or two. But 
Um, I really was hoping that if at any point anyone wants to jump in and add more, if at any point anybody has questions, even if you have questions for me, I, I shared a little bit about myself, but obviously I'm not in your class, so I, I don't know you guys very well, but if you have any questions for anything I've done or anything like that, just feel free to jump in and add it on. Um, same goes for the students. I, I think it would be okay if, um, if there's any questions for folks to just raise their hands and we can just have a, a really great conversation. Does that work for everyone? I think so, right? Okay, great. Well, we'll just get started talking about just in general. Um, you know, why is it so important to have women leaders for nonprofits in the 21st century, right? Um, I, I think that's an important question that, uh, you know, it, it, it's happening organically, but it, is it happening fast enough? Um, and, and I just want to get general thoughts on, on from, from everyone, from, from, from the panelists um, on, on why you think, what, what do you think is happening? And do you think that it's important? Do you think it um, should happen more rapidly? And, and just want to get your general thoughts. And I'll just kind of pick on somebody. I'll just try to pick on Brie for now, and then, and then we can go from there. And then anyone can add on. And Brenda, um, before we speak, since we have Dr. C here, we can also include her on the panel as well. She doesn't have to hang out there by herself. So, you know, <laughs> Let, let's get her thoughts on some things as, as well, if that's okay. Okay, that sounds great, actually. I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> put her put her on the spot, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what I do. <laughs> she, I've known for years. She would do that. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> <laughs> well, but no, just hearing all these things, and I, I think a lot of, um, of course, you know, the grassroots and the smaller organizations, but when you move into the larger organizations, I, I think that's where you see a concentration of women in the lower rungs of the organization and not in the leadership and the executive roles, um, even though in many cases in these organizations, the majority of the uh, constituents that they are serving are, are women um, and having women in those leadership roles would be um, allow them to better serve, you know, um, their communities. Um, but again, it, it really comes down to the board um, and, you know, and being able to, I think a lot of it is also mentorship. I, my first time serving in a nonprofit organization is because um, someone who I was kind of cross mentoring um, asked me to join a, a nonprofit board. Um, and I had never had that experience before, um, but that really allowed me to learn the ins and out of it um, and then eventually move into a board position from a secretary to a vice president, eventually into a president role and into board positions. But a lot of it does um, come down to networking and mentoring um, and finding sponsors are going to like Dr. Johnson was for me and getting me to to publish and also get involved in other organizations. Thank you, Dr. Garabao. And now, um, you know, actually, just because you said that, I, I kind of want to switch. I want to add to that question, to the first question is just, you know, let's talk about the importance of mentorships, right? Um, I know that that's something that I value the most. Um, that's how you, you know, it's it's a lot of folks you've heard. It's, 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 it's not what you know, but who you know. I think it's a little bit of a combination of both, right? But it's also... You know, making sure that you have uh, those mentorships and those connections. So let's talk about women in leadership and also um, just mentorships as well. Um, Bree, do you want to get started? Yeah, sure. So echoing all of that, you know, I think women are just underrepresented across all sectors for various reasons. But when it comes to nonprofits, research shows that women in leadership positions are more successful in realizing their missions and reaching their goals and um, their employees are more satisfied with the organization overall performance. And since we do make up 75% of nonprofit workforce, I mean, representation matters, right? Um, in leadership, especially, and we need our voices to be heard and respected and, and women in leadership nonprofit is just one small step in closing that gender equity gap across all sectors so the proof is kind of in the pudding there and honestly I think it's really important to highlight mentoring pro probably one of the most impactful things you can do is have a mentor in that leadership position um you know women in power are more than happy to be mentors to women to uplift them but you know that men are also just as excited to make that commitment and they're ready to do that. And it's all about intersecting those communities and working together with folks to 
influence, who have the influence to push our initiatives forward or ourselves forward. Absolutely. And bring you to the table, right? That's, I think, the important part. Um, that's one of my favorite things about Dr. Carabayo. She's always inviting us to the lunches and to the to the places where we need to be. So um, bringing people, women to the table. Um, Taylor? Hi. Um, so sorry, I was just typing the question so I can look at the question and, and speak okay. to it. Um, but I think it's important to have women in leadership positions in the nonprofit sector nonprofit sector because we do look at things from a different lens and I just want to simply talk about the intersectionality of race and gender for a moment um for my nonprofit you know I am a black woman and I serve black girls and it's so important for our black girls to see women who look like them in positions of power being able to to advocate for them and support them and to help them see life through a, a different perspective than what they're used to and i think having women in power is necessary because or at least in the leadership section and sector um because to me the nonprofit nonprofit sector is really about giving and empathy and being supportive of other people and making an impact and i think there's like Men, of course, they make an impact every day. Everyone makes an impact. But there's something about our relationships that we carry, that we build, that we, you know, kind of build from the ground up and the care that we take into that, that I think is, um, it just, it speaks volumes. And I, I really enjoyed, you know, my position in my nonprofit, even though I'm still recruiting staff and I'm recruiting volunteers and I'm in the very early stages of it. But when I get a phone call and they're asking me about, you know, my perspective of how a situation should be handled, whether that's a disciplinary situation or that's a situation about grading or just having a conversation and mentoring, I feel responsible for making sure that I'm making the right decision in that moment to be able to advise um, and give my opinion and my perspective on that because it's not about me I always tell my mentees it's not about me it's about the people behind me um, and that's just so necessary and I think women constantly have that in our minds like it's not just about us it's so much greater um, it's so much bigger and we have to be responsible in everything that we do Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, is there anything you would like to add, Abby or Dr. Carabayo? Yeah, I mean, I think Bree and Taylor both said exactly what I was thinking. I think the only thing that I would add is that I want to put an emphasis on our young women as well that are out there. Um, I mean, since returning home and searching for employment, I have been very particular about what I want and the leadership and the staff that I want to work with. And I think that um, at least here back home, I've noticed a lot of um, people that have been in positions for 20 plus years. And I would really love to see a bigger emphasis on younger women um, being involved in leadership and nonprofit organizations. So um, right now I'm, um... Uh, serving on a board and it's a very small board it's an organization called healthy little Havana and you know it's just for a neighborhood and it's it's, it's really great but um there the, there's a young girl that I'm mentoring because she's um one of the program managers and you know one of the things that I, I struggle with is is constantly mentoring her on not apologizing right um, and and she continuously says, oh, it's it's just uh, that's that's I just say sorry all the time, and and so I count it the other day during you know a meeting, and she said, I'm sorry, um, probably about 28 times I, I stopped counting, and you know every every other word she would say was I'm sorry, or or she would just apologize about things. So I I just and I, I notice that more in women, we we have a tendency to do that or say. Um, or just be apologetic about our 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 our, our, the, our position and and by the by, by the words we're saying. So, can you guys speak a little bit about that? Can you speak about why you think we, that happens and and how, how do we how do we help each other um, to to remind our, each other that we we don't have to apologize to to all the time and and we don't have to apologize um, constantly. I'll let anyone take it. <laughs> I can start on this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I I noticed that in 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 the way that I speak as well. I will constantly. Oh, I'm sorry, or I I apologize. And I think again, just talking about the intersectionality of race and gender, because they just truly go hand in hand for me in particular. You know, you're taught as, or at least I was taught as a younger girl. You know, there's a certain way that you show up in a room, and you can't be too aggressive. You can't be too assertive. You you have to be respectable, but also not too kind. So when you're trying to figure out like where you stand in that, and making sure that you're showing up and you're you're approachable, you're a strong leader, you're being kind, but you're also proving your point. Um, and you're being assertive, sometimes the lines can get blurred and you're like, maybe I'm being too much of this or maybe I'm too, being too much of that. And then you just kind of apologize. It's just a natural thing to apologize. And I think it's definitely something to work on. But I think something that you did with, with you know, counting how many times that the person apologized, I think that's good. And we should be monitoring each other on that. Like, hey, like, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. You don't have to apologize. And just reminding each other to be our most authentic selves and be comfortable and walking in that. And just going back to the conversation about mentorship that we were just talking about. Um, it takes mentorship to do that. And it, and it takes reminding each other and um, affirming each other and what we believe in and what we say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just having confidence. Um, you know, I was thinking that as you were talking about, I, I think Abby, was it Abby? I wrote it down. Oh, no, it was Brie. Um, no, it was Abby. I'm sorry that you talked about you were 16 when you started kind of in, in the role. And so what what do you, you know, what sometimes when we're younger, right, it takes a minute for us to to develop more confidence. And and so what do you tell individuals that say you're just you're a girl and you're you're really young for your position or for what you're doing? So um, what's your response to that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I actually um, being, you know, the young teenager that I was, um, I actually kind of forced myself to kind of take on um, these positions and responsibilities that I would have may have found uncomfortable um, in a setting, um, maybe in the school that I was going to. So for instance, um, you know, doing this outreach program that I created and talking to a bunch of students and teaching a bunch of students, um, the work that I have done for this comic book, um, doing my TEDx talk and public speaking um, was definitely another one to add to those lists. Um, these are all things that I've always dreamt of doing, um, but didn't think I could do. Um, because again, uh, you know, women are conditioned um, or taught in their lifetime um, to, um, you know, hone back on these things and um, really not, um, you know, shine through as much as they can. Um, so it was um, really um, important that I was, you know, surrounding myself with people that um, supported that and, um, you know, really wanted to see me succeed. Um, and, you know, now five years into um, being in the nonprofit sector, I, I definitely have um, confidence um, and a ability to just speak and talk and communicate um, more so um, than when I was younger. And I would really just um, say to young girls wanting to follow their dreams and the path that I took um, is to just practice and do the damn thing. I mean, I, we hold ourselves back so much. Uh, so I really just say, um, yeah, just go out and do it. Um, you're not going to be perfect the first time. Um, you're going to make mistakes, um, but the mistakes are a part of life and mistakes are going to make us stronger and be able to um, do and create better things. Um, it's always going to be a journey. That's great. Anyone else have anything to add? Yeah, let me just echo that really quick. Um, a mentor of mine, his name's James Whitfield from B Culture Consulting. He told me something. He said that you need to be comfortable in your discomfort. And that was like really powerful for me because, you know, going back to topics that you're probably talking about in this class, the glass ceiling, it's 
social barriers that prevent women and women of color specifically from advancing in their careers. And it's tracked back all the way through history to equity gaps. And those are driven by cultural stances against women and minorities. So it's something that you have to be comfortable doing. And it's a culture shift, right? If there's not discomfort, there's not change. So that's kind of one thing that I took away from Abby's talk. Just I love it. I love it. Um, and, you know, I, I've been in the field for a long time and I, I what you guys are saying are, are things I so experience, right? Um, where, you know, there's levels of discomfort right now as we're in the PhD program. I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm not an academic. I've had um, I've hired PhDs to do a lot of the work that you know I, I didn't know how to do, but I wanted to learn how to do it. So there's a lot of discomfort, but at the same time, you have to get comfortable in it. And so, um, so I appreciate that. But since you mentioned uh, glass ceilings, and I do want to get to some of the points from your class, um, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, let's talk about does the glass ceiling still exist for women? Um, I know that's pretty obvious question, but I want I want you guys to tell me a little bit more about what your thoughts are on that. And um, I, I'll start off with Dr. Catavaya and then <laughs> and then we can go from there. Um, yeah, I think. Dr. C, before you uh, before yeah. you respond, could you show that wonderful picture? Oh, oh of course, <laughs> I just pulled it up. Give me just a second. Yeah. So I was going through a box of photos recently and came across this one from my dad's graduation. That's your uh, so, <laughs> so I don't know if you guys can, could see it all that well, but um, that was me. And my dad, probably about more than 20 years ago, um, actually 30 years ago, I'm probably dating myself even more than that. <laughs> um, but yeah. That, I'm sorry, Dr. A little throwback. <laughs> Dr. C, is that you in the t-shirt, the young lady right there? That is me. That's me in the front. <laughs> and that was when my dad graduated with his master's um, from USF. I can't, I can't even tell you what part of campus that is. Anybody recognize that? <laughs> Not this campus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely, I'll have to ask where, where that was. I, I, uh, I would think I was in seventh grade at the time, so. <laughs> wow. Um, but you know, as far as kind of going back to the question, um, of course, since this is a, a, a course on nonprofit management, you know, hearing about these women in leadership, I, I think back to kind of the earlier classic management theory and Mary Parker Follett and her theory is, you know, the mother, mother of modern management in the sense of needing to work with people. Um, but in terms of the glass ceiling, I think that only changes when um, a majority changes and you have um, boards that are open and funding sources that are open to bringing on new leadership. Um, so I, I obviously have seen a shift, um, you know, in the sense of more women in, you know, senior leadership roles. But I think, like I said, going back to these conversations, it's about mentoring, it's about succession and, um, bringing forth opportunities. But I find that a lot of times um, women tend to limit themselves in going for opportunities. Um, we Going back to that confidence thing, we sometimes joke that a, a man will apply if he meets 10% of the criteria, <laughs> um, whereas a woman won't if she meets 90. Um, so, and a lot of times I've seen too many women discount themselves when they obviously are qualified for positions. They just need a little bit of nudge to be able to, you know, go for opportunities. But on the flip side of that is that when you're very good at your job, um, it becomes the curse of competency that you get overburdened um, with work. So being able to also create your boundaries and know your limitations. Absolutely. Anyone else want to add a little bit more about the glass ceiling? Uh, yeah, I can go. So. I'm a numbers person, so I'm going to bring it back to stats again. It's because numbers tell a story and that story is important. Um, women in 2019 accounted for almost 50% of the total workforce in the U.S., but when it came down to, you know, CEOs and C-suite positions, they only held 29% of those roles. And of those 29%, only 86% or 86 of them were white women. So there is something to be said about why that is, but 
things like gender roles can be blamed at, at a lot of times. So for example, um, if you look at the pandemic, it created a lot of strain on women, working women and minority women at large, because it's expected of them mostly to take on that role of caretaker in familial households. And um, so many of them passed up promotions, left their jobs or like postponed their educational opportunities. And they're really just set up for failure a lot of times as well. Um, glass cliff effect. I'm not sure if you talked about that in class yet, but I'm sure you'll learn about it if you haven't. Um, it's where women are offered promotions to positions of power during times of crisis and they're more likely to fail. And they're more likely to accept those positions compared to their male counterparts. And we need to kind of figure out why that is. It's it's a systemic issue that's not going away, but if we work together as a whole and we intersect those communities, we can push together um, that little slow moving needle in our favor. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit more about that, about COVID-19 and and women in leadership roles. Um, it's, it's a topic that I've been wanting to talk about because um, so you, just personally, I uh, was as a CEO and executive director of an organization and I was so afraid about my babies. I had two little babies that I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna take a break. And my excuse was also that I was gonna work on a PhD, but I wanted to, you know, keep those babies in a cocoon and and left that, that row. And I'm, I'm really, I'm actually kind of scared because you know, it was a pretty big move. And I know a lot of women made moves like that. So what is what is that what is that gonna do? And what are your thoughts about the women that did do that and 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 how do we support them? How do we how, what what are our thoughts? What are our general thoughts? And um Taylor, I'll I'll just pick on you. I'm so glad because I was so ready to jump into this. Great. <laughs> um I just want to start by saying the women who step down from positions of power um to take care of their families i have the most um admiration for those women i am inspired by them um because i think that we wear so many hats and it's not just about work and i think sometimes we put a lot of pressure on women to say oh if you step down from this position or if you have to step away from this position that's why you don't get promoted that's why women don't get promoted all the time because they have so many other responsibilities and i personally think that that's a cop out i think if you if women are so strong and capable and i think for you to even have gotten to the role that you got into as far as like being the ceo being being the executive director, you know, that I don't know how hard that you, you work to get to that point, but I'm sure it was very hard. And then to stay, take a step back and, and be with your babies and be with your family. Like I, it's impressive. It's, it's amazing. And you can always, you know, step back into the work if you want to, or maybe even figure out a different path or, you know, you know, whatever you you're interested in. And, um, yeah, so I just want to say like women who step down or women who who do both and manage being an executive director or manage a leadership position and manage being mothers and wives, it's powerful. And I think we can we are capable more than capable of doing both. And I, you know, personally I don't have any any children of my own yet. I am only 23, so I'm not even thinking about that. Um, but when I do decide to have my own family, I I I want to be able to do both, have my family and be the executive director and founder of my organization and feel confident in that. And if I choose to step down and I choose to um pass pass it along and, and serve as a board member or step down completely and walk away from my organization. I hope that I have the confidence to still be proud of myself um, because I can do both. I'm, I'm not forced to just only be a mother or, or be an ED or, or anything like that. That's great. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because I always think about what other people think, right? And so, um, and and even though that, even though I know in my in my heart that I, I made the right decision at the moment, and but you know what other pe women um, and what other individuals the uh, what they feel or what they perceive is important as well, and um, and and you know, and it's important uh, also for us to take that take. Um, 
what other people think and and take it for what it's worth, right? Because you're not going to always um, satisfy everyone, right? But at the same time, as long as you're satisfied within within your own self. And so I think that's important. Um, also, as far as COVID-19, I mean, the other piece was that um, some women didn't have, I had the choice to to step down um, and, 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 and transition a bit but there was women that didn't. And so that placed a lot of stress. I, I see a lot of uh, women that have been really burned out and then vice versa, the women that did step down. Um, so I worked uh, during the pandemic when it hit, we were in charge of homelessness, right? Um, and and we had we had the biggest shelter in the United States in San Antonio, which shelters don't exist in, in other places because all other places are housing first um, model, using housing first models, but in San Antonio, it's a more antiquated system. and so. They, um, we were, you know, it, 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 under a lot of scrutiny because uh, it was COVID and we didn't know what it was and there's shelters and there's a lot of homeless people. And it was, it was just, it was a lot of pressure. With that said, I was working, uh, you know, 13 hour days and, and it was very, very difficult, but that level of difficulty does not even compare to um, me quitting and taking care of my kids full-time because now that was hard. Um, I have to tell you that was to me one of the most difficult pieces to transition and, and then have two individuals, two human beings just depending on you, right? And so just with that said, I share that, but just to, so we can have a little bit more of a conversation of how do we help women get out of those uh, situations that they, a lot of women have been in and and, and still want to be contributing to the nonprofit um, arena. So I'll just, um, if anybody wants to talk on it. Um, I, I think that it's, it's an institutional problem, honestly. So companies should be supporting women and making some some type of service or some type of compromise when things like that happen and not just for women it should just be for families in general um when women need to step down from these positions or women in color need to step down in the, in these positions it takes a toll on a lot of their advancement um because you can't really tell a story if you're just showing a resume, right? It doesn't tell you what the background is on that. So it's an institutional situation that needs to be addressed with companies at large and policies maybe need to be addressed in that area. Um, but you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's hard for women to just shift completely into caregiver to full-time home taker and education like a teacher basically like Hugo you know how hard it is to teach students it's if you don't have the experience it's you, it's very difficult to just shift that change and do both things at the same time if you don't have support yeah I just want to jump in so I just observed I know what you were just smiling about and do you, you want to say something yeah Thank you, everyone. Um, I can totally relate to your journey. I'm a mother of three. Um, can I hear her? Can you hear? Can you yes. hear? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Is that Nusha? I'm sorry. Yes. Hi, Abby. Hi, <laughs> Taylor. It's like reunion. <laughs> yeah, and hi, Bree. I haven't met you or had class with you. This is actually my first time and last time because uh, I graduate. So, um, but yeah, I've been a mom and I've had to leave jobs, and uh, you know, it's been a journey and my background is in higher ed. So um, lots of, you know, getting the position, you know, um, juggling the babies and then having to leave, take care of them. Uh, and now I'm back full time five days while my husband is holding it down at home. But, um, you know, so thank you. And I appreciate um, your courage. Thank you. Thank you. But I, I, I I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, and I can share my own personal struggles of trying to find that work-life balance. You know, I have a 19-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son um, who's been basically homeschooling since the start of the pandemic. So, you know, with special needs, ADHD, you know, it's been a challenge, but, you know, being able to try and find those resources and also, again, being 
a mother, a wife, and also having elderly in-laws and being part of those sandwich generations, we have a lot of things pulling us in a lot of different directions. And I think that a lot of us, we have this inclination to want to be all things to all people and, you know, figure we can kind of take care of things. But a lot of it does come down to, you know, um, and not to leave the men out, finding allies um, and helping us change policies. Um, when I was pregnant with my son, um, I was finishing the PhD program and was interviewed for a career services coordinator position in the department where I'm now teaching. Um, and I was fortunate that the chair at the time, Dr. Mohammed Al Qadri, um, hired me when I was six months pregnant, you know, with my son about to finish the program, but then allowed me to work from home for three months so I could have a paid maternity leave since I didn't qualify under FMLA. Um, things like that make a huge impact. And even though I took a pay cut to take that position, um, it made me loyal to the organization, to the department, and I was able to grow from there. But we need to be able to come forward to find solutions that work, you know, um, you know, to be able to allow us, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have had these opportunities to go into the workforce, you know, into academia and to have the career if there weren't um, mentors, men, women, um, who are willing to give opportunities and to make a, a smoother path to be able to make it possible to, to ascend in our careers. Yeah, and I really just want to add to that quickly, just looking for employment in this sector. I have really taken value to organizations um, that really provide flexibility and benefits, especially that are um, more impactful for women or people who are starting families. Um, I mean, I'm only 23, but I mean, I when I'm looking for an organization, I'm looking for an organization to stick with and be dedicated to. And, um, you know, if I'm in an organization five years from now, I'm probably going to want to start having a family. And so um, really just, you know, asking the right questions. Um, I just um, had an interview um, for a position, a nonprofit local to here in New Jersey um, that does provide those benefits that um, are important and um, just really um, knowing what to look for, knowing, um, you know, what is um, appropriate to ask um, questions in, in terms of, you know, um, the flexibility and benefits and, um, you know, just being able to have um, like in my most recent interview, being able to have those conversations where um, people have, um, you know, have their own families, um, women in leadership roles, especially, and um, know how important that is to them as well, um, has been very impactful. Absolutely. That's great. You know, I, I, I wanted to ask, I, I just realized that we should probably save a little bit of time just to see if anyone has any questions in the audience. But I have one last question I just wanted to kind of touch base on because when I saw it on the list of potential questions, I thought about the fact that it's a good opportunity to have the conversation and it's how can women partner with other groups to make a difference, et cetera. But when I saw it, I first thought it said, how can women partner with women? and other groups um, to make a difference. And so that's something that, you know, I think I found have found very beneficial. I used to be part of a, a, afford, a women of affordable housing group. And, you know, it was it was a small group, but it was, you know, we were very few that were involved in development of affordable housing and the the, the finance pieces and, and so on and so forth. But we could have these discussions and have happy hours, an excuse to have a happy hour, right? Um, but but get to know each other and, and help each other out. So just wanted to ask that question to the group. So how can we partner with other groups and with other women to make a, a difference um, and with to, for each other and, and a difference in, in the community? You know, Brenda, let me just jump in there very quickly because, I, you know, the question you just raised is an important one, right? And it, and it goes along with this, this notion of debunking the myth of women not being able to work with other women, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that certainly comes up as a narrative is when Hillary Clinton did not win, folks would always say, and you know, uh, if there's truth to this or not, history will have to, to note that, right? But certainly the narrative was that, oh, you know, women just did not vote for Hillary Clinton, right? So so to your to your question, like how how do how do we as a society, women specifically in 
uh, and and allies of women. How do how do we all debunk this myth that women simply can't or don't want to work together? I can start this one um, with the first question, um, just being that, hold on, let me take a break. Women working with other women in organizations. I think the first step would be to reach out and to do our research on the women who are in the field that we're in. Because when I first started my nonprofit, I didn't really know who to speak to about the work. I didn't know who to go to. When I think of a person, even today, I have to kind of help myself think about who's the best person to talk to for this situation that I need help with. Is it the program manager who I need to be going to, or is it the executive director that I need to reach out to on LinkedIn or via email through another introduction? And I think it's important to, to do our research on who can we connect with who, who's in a similar situation as ourselves. And I think right now what I'm trying to practice is finding women who are in leadership roles, who have been where I am right now, um, as far as starting an organization from the ground up and trying to grow it, trying to find board members, trying to raise money, finishing your education early and finding those women who I align with and being confident enough um, to reach out to them and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is um, what I'm proud of that I'm doing. This is where I need support. Is it possible to set up an informational um, informational interview with you to pick your brain about these things? I see that you are an expert here um, and that you have this experience. And how can I learn from you in that way? And I think just being vulnerable as women and not thinking that we have to kind of take everything on ourselves and learn everything by ourselves and really seek that mentorship that will really help us. And I also think debunking the narrative of, of women not being able to work with other women. I've heard that, that narrative, um, but I think it just comes down to teaching young girls to be kind to one another um, and to support one another. Because I think a lot of times, and I see it in my, my organization now and my programs now, with the girls that I work with, sometimes we believe that there can only be one girl in the spotlight and that's just not true. And practicing lifting each other up, that will help us you know, grow into women who support each other. And when I see a colleague doing well, when I hear Abby's doing well or Bria's is doing well, I have nothing but love and respect for them and feeling like I wanna see them thrive because I know when they thrive, <laughs> they're going to come back and help me or they're gonna come back and help another girl or another woman from their community. And it just speaks to the character of the type of women that we surround ourselves with. So that's right. two chat, two links in the, in the chat. Um, just wanted to get recognized two organizations where I've not only met some amazing women in um, nonprofit, but also just made lifelong friends. So um, through these organizations. So the first is the section for women in public administration for ASWA, the American Society for Public Administration. I was a, a treasurer and then a president um, of the organization and just made amazing friends from across the country and the world through that organization. This is, um, Dr. C, this is SWAPA, right? Yeah, SWAPA. Okay. Yeah, we, we love our acronyms. So <laughs> SWAPA, the section for women in public administration. And then the other one is the League of Women Voters, um, which has chapters all across, you know, the country. Um, I know the Miami, Miami-Dade um, chapter, you know, has been really, or, you know, well organized and really promotes the nonprofit, you know, sector in, in South Florida. So they're a great organization for networking as well. Um, and then just kind of beyond that, my daughter was in a mentoring program, um, you know, growing up called Honey Shine, uh, which was founded by uh, Tracy Morning, Alonzo Morning, um, a wife here in South Florida. And uh, honestly, the organization did such a great job of just promoting sisterhood um, and just to see the outpouring of all the different organizations, both locally and nationally, um, that supported that organization. So there are a lot of great organizations doing work to promote um again just womanhood and sisterhood it's crazy 
Dr. Johnson, I'm glad you brought it up. And, you know, just to add to that, you know, not as not such a positive story, but it ends positively um, with the initial story that I shared. You know, I was I was 28 when I first started as a first senior um, uh, senior level uh, female in, in a nonprofit organization. It was a big nonprofit organization. We had over 300 employees. And I, um, I experienced uh, a little bit of a lot of the women there had been there for 20 years and um, they had never been promoted. And so here came this young girl that nobody knew. And I, you know, took on a director level position. And so there was um, a lot of pushback. There was a, a lot of um, discomfort. Um, there was moments I'm, I, you know, I don't think I've ever shared this publicly, but I, I would go to my office and just cry because I was like, why, why can't they accept, you know, that. And, and they would just think I was a college student when indeed I actually grew up in affordable housing and I grew up homeless when I was orphaned at a young age. And therefore that's why I was passionate about doing the providing services and doing the things that I was doing. Um, but they didn't know that, right? They just saw a young college student. That's what they would call me. With that said, um, there was a point where I had to like go above it. And you know, I think the, the confidence threatened um, certain individuals and then at the end of the day, I, I I do feel that people learn from example. And so if you set an example and you empower others, you set an example and you you go above those type of things and you you just you 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 show um other women that how it should be done and you lead by example, it's just it, it's a trickle, it's a trickle down effect. Everybody, everybody starts kind of becoming more positive and and doing more positive things. And and that was my personal experience because. I mean, I had criticisms from everything. Like, why is she wearing stilettos? And I was just like, these are the shoes I wear. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. But then at the end of it, um, you know, everybody was kind of dressing the same. Everybody was dressing more professional. Everybody was, and, and it just, it, it, the culture just caught on because it was positive. There was no more, you know, hating on each other or, you know, because you ha oftentimes just have to lead by example and, and people will follow. And so that's just a personal testimony as far as, you know, you know, that misconception that women can't work with each other. Some of my best friends are from that job, from that first job that initially I cried at. <laughs> so awesome. Wow. Yeah. Um, awesome. So I, I know we have 50, about 15 more minutes. I don't know if, if you, uh, Dr. Johnson, you want to continue for you, you like for us to continue having more conversation or we should open it up to questions from from the sure. class or. I, I would like to open up uh, to the class for questions because I know there are many. But I, you know, there's one thing that I don't want us to to uh, I, I want to make sure we we put an exclamation point on it, on it, and that is the role of a mother, right? Um, I mean, you spoke to it passionately, and Dr. C and and Taylor and and others, um, Rudy and so forth, Abby. Um, but in my estimation kind mothers make kind sons, right? And so this is, I, I think that um, this is what we want out of our society. You know, we want the mothers like all of you to say, you know, this, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that my son grows up in a different way, but he appreciates all women and he appreciates, uh, you know, everything that women bring to the world. You know, I, I, I think that's so important. So, you know, kudos to you, Brenda, for making that decision to leave your position to be with your baby because that will come back to you tenfold. Right? Thank you. I, I hope so. There, there are a lot of work. <laughs> but they're, they're, <laughs> they're four and five now. So it's been it's been a bit of a journey, but uh it's a lot of work, but it's it's really it's really rewarding. And at the same time, you know, from you know, we talk about investments, right? And and they're my investment because they like I am completely in love with them. <laughs> and so and I know Dr. C is so connected with her daughter, who's now a young lady, and her son, who I've seen pictures of. He's such a cute little boy. And she and her husband are putting the time in, they're putting the work in. To make sure that little boy grows up to be an intelligent young man who's doing things for his community and reaching back to his mama and saying thank you answers that he but certainly to his mama so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and with that we'll open it up for questions 
Yeah, and I would like to continue that conversation. Um, so I grew up in, in Africa. I grew up, I was raised in South Africa. Hang on, hang on one second. Can everybody hear you go? Okay. Okay. Um, so I, uh, by the way, good to see Taylor, Abby, Andre. <laughs> um, I grew up in South Africa, and I, I don't know how many of you are aware, but um, in South Africa, women are more like people makers. Um, I, I realized growing up, my dad actually made my mom, you know, leave her career to kind of raise us, you know, so she was pretty much stay at home mom until we all turned like 24. You know, and after my dad passed away, uh, she kind of lost her identity. She, I mean, it took her a while because, I mean, you know, she was a housewife full time and, you know, it was a struggle for her. Um, even though my siblings and I, you know, we both turned out very well, um, my sister didn't agree with that idea of being a stay at home mom for, for, my, for my mom. And to some extent, it resented my dad for you know, letting her stay at home and raise us. And now looking back, you know, um, my sister is married now. She has a job in a top financial company doing well. Um, her husband also is, is in a high paying position in, in pharmaceutical. Now they have two kids, you know, and, and it's interesting because last week I was talking to her, you know, her last kid actually, because they work so hard, my sister and her husband, they are, they are not usually at home, um, so they have nannies take care of kids, you know, and for the first time, her kid talked, you know, she called her nanny mom, and she just had this feeling that she's in connection with her kids, and every time they come back from work and the nanny is not there, the kids are crying because they want the nanny around, you know, <laughs> so she talked to me, it's kind of feeling bad, what do I do, I still... I want to be around to take care of my kids. And now she's realizing the impact of the role my mom played when she was a star of mom. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm talking to my mom now, you know, you know, explaining to her, you know, what she's feeling and now getting to apologize for how she felt of what my dad made her do at the time. And realizing that even though she's all about, you know, her career, you know, now she's a mom, she has to realize that. She, she has to find a way to prioritize her position, you know, as, as a full-time worker, but also her position as a mom, because you don't want to lose that thing with your case, right? Um, so she's thinking through what her options are, of course, you know, in talks with her husband to see what they have to do, because they don't want to lose their kids, you know, <laughs> you know to someone who, who is their nanny, because obviously the kids, they, they look such a special connection with her. Why? Because they spend almost their day and their time, you know, with the nanny, especially when, you know, they are at work, when they are not home, when they are taking vacations together and all that. So it, 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 it hits me, you know, the role of, 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 of a mom, you know, trying to be big time, you know, in, the, in your various positions. So I do, I do, I do want to acknowledge what that you guys, you guys do. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. And my sister is navigating through that as she goes, as she gets around that. Hopefully she will figure out a good way to keep it people and to be able to be a full-time mom who is involved in her kids' life. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know, you know, I, I, I just wonder though, what about the husband? Is he does he feel he's losing the connection with the kids or is that <laughs> not part of the conversation? <laughs> I think it's the same way too. Okay. Same way. But for moms, it's kind of different. You know, because that's supposed to be your role, you know. <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't feel the same way on this. Um, I, I think the conversation they're having is how do we, even him as well, you know, how, you know, they're thinking about putting their breaks on, you know, on their hours at work to kind of make time for their kids, mm -hmm. you know, spending time with them, even if it's going on vacation with them, you know, weekends, you know, no, no work plans, just be at home with the kids, do stuff with them. They are kind of like getting it together as a, as a, as a family. But again, it, it can be tough, especially on moms, because you feel responsible mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, I, I think the balance, right? The balance is always... Um... It's the tough part, uh, you know, I, so I, I'm working on a PhD, so it's not like I'm completely not doing anything. And so like even right now, I have a 30 page page of paper due at midnight tonight. And so, um, you know, and but at the same time, I always feel that my children sense my stress. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and 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 you know just trying to balance it because sometimes I, I get after them and I'm thinking wait am I really upset or is it because they're bothering my stress right and so the balance is always the the tricky part but um but but you're I I appreciate the fact that folks realize uh, what what a role it is and what an important role it is not only to the family but for, for the community as well may I add to that I was just going to say from experience, it doesn't have to be all or none. Sometimes like, he, she, you know, she could still have her job and maybe ask for a couple of days of, you know, working from home, right? And like that hybrid, because uh -huh. I've been at home fully too and, and, and like gone stir crazy. And then <laughs> now I'm like full time now. And it's like, um, there, you know, you as, as I've gotten older, and crashed and burned several times I've learned to create that balance like understand when I'm like crashing and or when my family's crashing and create that space so, yeah. yeah I think it is it's a matter of finding your own kind of personal balance and, and what works with you and your family um, in different circumstances you know when my daughter was born I had the luxury to stay home for a year um, but with my son it was three months kind of working you know during that time um, you know, even now, you know, I, I feel like I have the dream position because I get to basically, you know, work a very flexible schedule, you know, mainly from home. Um, I'm able to get assistance to come in and help with my son, you know, as needed. Um, but also, given those uh, circumstances, I've passed up applying for other opportunities that might have paid more money or had greater, you know, career growth because it just the time isn't right for me, you know, and at one point or another, I, I'm not in a position to leave Florida. So the same thing, I'm not going to entertain jobs that are outside, even as much as I would love to go back to California. Um, the time isn't right. So I think you find what's best for you. It's, you know, best for your family, but also just knowing that circumstances change, you know, and you find what, what works for you and, you know, at that time. You know, I also want to add, and, and thank you, Dr. C, and, and Brenda for saying that. And um, so, so, Brenda, once you get your PhD, we'll call you Dr. B. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. B and Dr. C. Dr. We're so cool, Dr. Dr. Gutter. <laughs> so, but I, I want to make sure we also, you know, uh, that we're being as, in, as inclusive as possible, and that is to acknowledge women who uh, choose not to have kids, right, uh, but they want to focus on their career. And also certainly to acknowledge uh, that not all women are heterosexual because we're kind of, you know, painting this uh, heteronormative uh, construct that I just want to make sure that we have space for all women in all of their various forms and, and uh, appreciate what they bring to the table. So just want to make sure we put that out there. As a social equity scholar, that's very important. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that also ends up becoming a burden is that sometimes um, there's this perception that if um, they don't aren't married and don't have kids that they can do additional work and not respecting that they have their own priorities and their own, um, you know, yeah. life outside of work, you know, and to respect those boundaries. That's right. Exactly. That's right. I, I, I'm, I'm question jumping back to um, women who you know, have experience raising children and, and looking at, you know, I think a lot of times people see if there's a gap in the resume for that purpose, they see it as a gap. Whereas I tend to think, and we went through a recent hiring process, my interest was, oh, think about the perspectives and, the, and what they gained through that experience. And I'm curious if you can speak to, you know, I think that that should be something that's considered <laughs> in hiring practices. And is there any sort of conversations being had around that that change in 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 you know when folks apply to a job looking at that as valuable experience versus a gap? Hmm. I can just say my first job going back after my my daughter's one talking about joining a mommy group and um, helping to organize events and networking and just kind of played in, you know, the events that I was doing, you know, coordinating with with other moms in terms of, you know, how those skills were transferable, even, you know, while I was staying at home. You know, I, from experience, um, you know, I, I was managing a lot of people and um, leading a lot of folks when I wasn't a mother. And um, I, I remember I had a different way of thinking. 
and um and I would look at a gap and see be and think oh it's a gap and now I know better right now I know exactly what you said so I think there it goes back to um what Beer was mentioning, like some institutional changing, some some training, some like exposure, some some talk, having these conversations is critical. Um, because otherwise you just if you if you're just going through the motions, um, you see gaps as you know questionable. Um, I, I remember I specifically remember, and I, you know, I, I always tell I used to always tell my staff, 10 years from now, if I'm the same leader I am now, I'm gonna be very disappointed because I want to be that much better 10 years from now. I want to be completely different. I want to look back and say, wow, I was so, I didn't know anything 10 years ago, right? Because I learned so much in those past, last, in, in, in those, in these past 10 years. And so, uh, you know, some of this does come with time and experience, but some of it can be learned and some of it is in the, in the hands of the folks in this room, right? Um, you know, having these conversations and talking about it, so. Yeah, and I, I want to just add to that a little. I mean, I have uh, gaps on my resume with my work history. I've taken the last two years um, while also going to USF and finishing my bachelor's degree to really focus on my physical and mental health. I've suffered uh, traumatic brain injuries in my lifetime. And, um, you know, I, I haven't had a full-time job uh, in the past two years. Um, and um, when I was working full-time jobs, prior to that, I was working a full-time job and working at my nonprofit, going to school, it, you know, it really took a toll on my health um, and uh, really, uh, you know, taking a step back and, you know, knowing that, you know, not everything is, um, you know, all at once and making sure to, um, you know, take that time to take care of my health really taught me a lot about, um, you know, my self-worth, my, my ability to be resilient in stressful situations, um, things like that um, has been um, something that I love to be open and honest about and um you know because i think the more we have conversations about you know what people go through in their everyday lives the more we can um break down those barriers um and create institutional change like Bree has said um to just be more uh human when we're uh talking um to each other in these work settings you know we're all human and it's not always so you know cut and dry nine to five monday through friday um you know there's a lot of um work that people put in to get where they're able to be great so you know we are at time i want to give our moderator brenda uh the the uh, last word, please, to close us out. So, bring a few words. Sure. Um, I I do believe that there is a lot of uh, a lot we can do. Um, and I do believe these are the conversations that we need to make time. Not even after you leave acad academia, um, you're when you're not a student, you, you get into this really fast paced um culture where you're just going from meeting to meeting and employee issue after employee issue and this and that and and but we we oftentimes forget to have these very important conversations so I want to encourage everyone in this room once you when when you are in your leadership roles when you are wherever you end up wanting to be um continue to have these conversations they're important and they're important to have also I just wanted to mention just because I didn't want to forget Taylor you had mentioned a little bit about personalities and when you were talking I thought about a book I just recently read it's called um Bureau Men Settlement Women um I you, it's a popular book but I had never read it until recently and the author's Camila Cyrus and um you know it, it's about what you were talking about so I recommend you read it it's personally you I think would you know you would love it so um type it in the chat please I really love when people recommend books to me <laughs> <laughs> no problem no problem thank yeah. you Dr. Johnson for the opportunity oh it, it's been one great but I was going to pick on Taylor for a second as I was doing you know now that she's uh graduated with her her master's degree she has time to read books yeah <laughs> <laughs> I told someone recently that I don't I ne I don't read. I'm not a reader, but yeah. I've read like I don't know 20 books this past year, but I'm not a reader. Like I just have to read. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs>
Yeah, you know, I, I, I got to tell you all that I am incredibly proud of um, um, our m &A students and uh, uh, we are now our m &A alumni, uh, alumnus, alumni, <laughs> alumni, um, uh, Abby and Taylor. They, to me, they're still, you know, young bucks in a graduate program, but they, they've graduated and they're out there kicking ass and yeah. I couldn't be more proud. And uh, to you, Brenda, I am equally as proud as well because you'll be coming into the professional under the 